Welcome to Foundation. For more episodes, check out foundation.kr. In this episode, I sat down with David Copperfield, an entrepreneur and also one of the greatest magicians of our time. Let's go talk to him. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is awesome because, um, you know, typically I have tech entrepreneurs on the show. Yes. And then I realized that uh, when Tony Shea said that you were available, I realized you're actually an entrepreneur as well. Well, um, and I wanted so to dig into that a little bit and talk about you know how you got started and uh, kind of discover your whole history of uh, of how you got to where you are today. I think we're kind of all in the same business. So we all uh, uh, try to push the envelope. We all try to do things differently. Try to to have a. a take what we do well and, and, and change the world in our own little way. Whether we're a, a tech person or an entertainer or a communicator or a writer. Um, you know, I started as a, um, as a very bad ventriloquist uh, when I was a little kid and uh, by watching this guy named Paul Winchell on TV. And um, uh, he, was, he invented the uh, artificial heart. He had a patent for the artificial heart. He was a ventriloquist. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on, uh, and he invented the, you know, the first patent for the artificial heart. So it kind of inspired me to, to, to take entertainment and not just stop at that, to think of uh, applying you know, uh, my interests, and my loves, my passions to as many other things. You know? What age were you when you first got into uh, Were you actually a ventriloquist yourself? I, I, no? I, I, you know, I was. I was really ho horrible at seven years old. And uh, uh, they couldn't tell which one was the dummy, so I had to get rid of that. <laughs> and I, I started doing magic. And magic, for some reason, uh, was very easy for me. It was a very, very, uh, uh, you know, I kind of I sucked at everything else. But, but at magic, I was, I was good at, at it. At seven, where did you find your first trick? I mean, who brought that to you? Was that something where your family did that? Or? I'd, I'd go to the library, and I would uh, take out a book. Remember libraries, by the way? <laughs> uh, um, still a few of them left. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, it's uh, under L. I think. Uh, uh, now, I, um, I went to the library and I would take the magic book and I would read the effect of you know, the, what the audience would see and uh, not look at the method, not look at how the technology of making it work or the secret behind it and see if I could come up with a way to make it work myself. And I would invent magic by doing that, I invent new magic. And when I was 12 years old, I invented my first uh, piece of magic that was published in this this encyclopedia, pretty respected encyclopedia of magic called Tarbell Course in Magic. So my, I was an inventor in magic when I was 12. How did you, what, what did you do at, so at around 11, you're coming up with this, uh, do you draw a diagram for how it'll work and you send it off to the company, or how does that work? It wasn't quite like that, no. It was, this, this was a trick with a flare pen. Remember flare pens? Mm -hmm. You don't remember. Yeah, I know what flare pen is. <laughs> I'm 36. It, so I'm it, a little... it, it, it had a unique quality that when you turn the pen, the top the little white thing at the top would move with it. So that provided part of the secret of the illusion. So I discovered that, you know, if you did that, and that started me thinking about how I can make a little mind reading effect with that. So as a little kid, that was, you know, the, it was easy for me, you know. And uh, uh, when I was 16 years old, I was, I was teaching at NYU. There was a little program in the theater department. I teach the art in magic and trying to, to do that. So magic, the whole magic part was very, very easy. And I know a lot of your watchers, you know, find you know, mathematics easy, or they find just uh, uh, how to structure companies easy, or all this kind of, for me, just inventing magic, creating that stuff, or performing, it was an easy thing for me. Um, but my real passion was communicating with people. My passion was telling stories. Everything that I, um, I wanted to be wasn't a magician. I wanted to be uh, Orson Welles. I wanted to be uh, Frank Capra, great film directors, Frank Sinatra, uh, uh, performers Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. I wanted to, to do what, what they were, how they were making me feel when I saw a movie, a great movie, or Wizard of Oz, I could really move, uh, be moved as an audience. But I was good at magic, I was, I was kind of screwed because you know, like, how am I gonna take magic and do that with it? Um, so I had to find a way of, of, of combining the two. And uh, that was really the kind of the, the, the signature of what I brought to magic. It really was telling stories with magic. Was your family pretty supportive of you at, at 16? Or were they like, hey, we want you to go to college, like what are you doing? 16, no. 12, yes. <laughs> 16, you know, you should be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, do, do that kind of thing. And, and that, my mother is really tough on me, you know. In, in my show, I tell a story about my grandfather being really tough on me. And, uh, but it's really about my mom, who was alive when I wrote that piece in the show. Uh, and that negative reinforcement actually worked for me. It was, it was something that really uh, uh, spirited me forward, made me fight to prove that I, I was, uh, that I was right for me, not, not 
that she was wrong, but the, I, I was right. So I really struggled to, to, to figure out how to make this very uh, off, you know, uh, off track job a, a, a career that I could actually feed a family with. So, um, but it was really looking at the big picture of what other entertainment forms did and uh, model myself not after you know, other magicians. I modeled myself after film directors. And, and um, you know, in fact, uh, Tony Shea was, uh, today was talking about how you know, great innovation comes from people who are, who are looking outside their own, their own world of expertise to put into their own line of work. And that's exactly, that's my, my secret. If that's the biggest secret is to really uh, uh, look at you know, people like yourself and people you know, like uh, uh, Elon Musk who you know, just didn't take no for an answer and just found mm -hmm. ways of, of interpreting what th they were good at and combining it with uh, what they learned from other sources. At, at what point did you realize this is gonna be a career for me? Like this is something that I can actually make a living at and, and have a family? I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, and that's, I, I make a joke out of it, but, but it's actually true. I, I think the people that I really admire, the people who have lasted, stay hungry. They just stay hungry. And um, uh, they're never really satisfied. I'm not sure that's the healthiest <laughs> thing in the world. But, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to try to expand my, uh, kind of my reach on what I can give to people as, uh, as an artist or as a communicator, as a, you know, and it, uh, so I think, I know a lot of people who have very short careers in show business, and it's because they lose that, that passion, you know. And um, I thank God I still have it, you know. It's for me, you know, I, I talk about these three words that are my, uh, uh, my thing, and it's passion, uh, preparation, and persistence. And whether you're a magician or an illusionist or a, a TV producer or, you know, or, or a technological wizard guy, you know, it's a matter of, of uh, having those same things. You're really passionate about something, you really love, have a belief in something, and are willing to prepare, you know, preparation and or persistence, because God knows, you know, the world throws all this negative stuff at you all the time, and they tell you you can't, and you know, and, and you'll make mistakes, and you have to really, you know, brush yourself off and, and keep going. What was the um, point when you had your first paid gig as a magician? I think it was uh, 10. Five bucks, five bucks. Balloon animals. <laughs> they all look like poodles. <laughs> Divino, the boy magician, yes. But even that, you know, even in that show, it was I'd do a routine all with light bulbs. You know, there was a magician who did a light bulb act, but I would do a routine. It was all timed to music, and the lighting counted. Everything, you know, it's it's, it's like an apple box. You know, it, the, the apple, everything counts in the in a piece of apple packaging. You know, you open it up, and the feel of the paper is important. The, uh, the you know the colors, the, the you know the texture and how it's folded, uh, well, the type, uh, the um, the fonts that are used. Everything is important. And from when I was a kid. I, because I looked at these movies, which had beautiful art direction, and beautiful lighting, and beautiful color coverage. I wanted my magic to be that. So I was kind of uh, uh, you know, doing that with my magic, even at a very young age. And uh, probably screwing up a lot, but at least trying. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were the youngest person uh, elected to the Society of American Magicians. Uh, what is that exactly? For the people that, that don't follow. To be elected, or? or no, of the, of the, uh, the society. <laughs> The Houdini, Houdini started an organization called the SAM, Society of American Magicians, uh, with another group of people. He was the, the second president or something like that for seven years or nine years. And uh, it's, you know, a lot of great magicians belong to it. It's more of a communal uh, group of, um, of uh, you know, hobbyists and professionals. But uh, Houdini was a large part of that. And they, they've since given me a lot of very flattering awards. But, I'm, you know, I'm just, again, I think just getting it right, just keep, you know, uh, getting it right is, is what I try to do. And, and uh, I've, you know, I've done certain things which are pretty good. And, um, you know, the next things that I'm working now, I'm just, you know, I'm like you. I'm, I'm on the iPhone just thinking of ideas and here's a good music choice for this. Here's a good way of changing the script. And here's how it can affect people in a different way with, with this art form that's usually meant to go, you know, the, uh, when I started Magic, it was all about making people go like that, which is pretty good. You know, it's not a bad thing to have people, you know, go, mm -hmm. go, wow, you know, how'd you do that? But that was never enough for me. You know, that's like somebody just singing well. You know, that's not enough. You have to 
have them really care about you or what you're saying, the words you're saying, the stories you're telling, uh, what they know about you as a person. Uh, the movie of your life is as important as just being able to sing well. Unfortunately, in magic, if you are able to fool people, they'll think you're a great magician. So there's a lot of magicians who can fool people but are kind of don't have all those other qualities, but people will still go, wow, that was great, you know. Right. And, um, you know, the requirement, uh, you know, if, if somebody has an app and it's an okay app, the world will go, no, that's not so good. You know, the, the world will go, go on. But in magic, if something fools you, unfortunately, uh, that is a, a level of, of excellence in many people's eyes because they don't know the difference. Um, but um, that's a kind of frustration for people like me or Penn and Teller, people that are you know, really you know, working hard to, to make a difference and to, to, to have a point of view that's unique. Yeah, what do you think about, speaking of just you know, a, a performance versus just someone that's doing standard street magic or something like that, especially with the internet, what do you think about the fact that you, know, you can go on YouTube now and pretty much search for any type of trick yeah. and there'll be some type of explanation yeah. or reveal there. Does that, does that bother you? Is that something that, you know, when you have these meetings at the society you talk about. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been to a few, uh, to a few I, meetings. I like lately. to think of the society as a secret, yeah. like you have to wear black yeah, cloaks and, and things yes, like yes, that. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work like that. But, but, but it's interesting that, um, you know, it's a really excellent question because the world has obviously changed for everything, you know, not just for magic. We have accessibility, which is good and bad to everything, uh, and good information and bad information. You know, for me, um, there's two, two things I can say about it. You know, what I do, ever since there was a guy on TV called The Masked Magician on TV, it was before the internet, uh, where this guy came in who was exposing magic. Oh, I remember that guy. Yeah. Well, you guys tried to hunt him down at some point. I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't a hunter. But, uh, <laughs> but what it did was it was it He was, was showing of, all the, the reveals for all the tricks, right? But see, you, you, that's the problem. You thought it was real, and most of them wouldn't work. Most of them were kind of fake explanations that really wouldn't work, Interesting. you know? And, but people believed them, which was sort of as bad. It's like the people go, oh, yeah, okay, they were kind of interested because they saw what they thought was real, it would, it really would never work if you really think through it. So you want to shake them, no, it's not real, isn't it? we worked hard on this, it's not that simple thing. Um, but uh, so what I did in reaction to that, and again, this is before the inter whole internet, uh, you know, uh, experience happened, um, what I would do is I, I would have three or four methods for each of my illusions. When I would fly in my show, and I'd fly, you know, through hoops, and I'd so, you know, fly in a plexiglass box, and I flew with a girl in my arm, arms, and uh, you know, I would do uh, another illusion. I'd produce uh, banished people from the audience. I'd have four methods, or at least three methods for each illusion. Before I ever debuted it, I'd spend like three years coming up with an illusion. So if somebody on the internet exposed something, or tried to expose it, or was close, I'd keep the illusion, I'd get to keep it, and I'd change the method. Hmm. I was in, um, in Turkey. And a guy did this illusion where I vanished a bunch of people in the audience, and never did anybody reveal the secret ever in like years of doing it. And this guy was a singer. I didn't know, a, a, a Turkish singer. And he went on TV, and for publicity for himself, he went out and he exposed, kind of close to what he experienced. Didn't know the whole thing, because they don't really know everything. And um, the next day, I was able to change the method. I did it a whole different way. And the audience, read this thing in the paper, because in, in Turkish press, it was a huge thing that this guy was exposing my stuff, because I was there for like this one week. And I said, you know, I know this guy exposed the thing, and, and they started booing the guy. They said, boo, maybe to support me. I'm not sure if they were just being patronizing me. Right. And then I said, but we're not going to show you this is not the way. And I did the illusion, and they like got up there. It was like Rocky Balboa. You know, they were cheering, <laughs> yeah, he beat this guy. And you know what that says is that people really are curious. I mean, your audience and you know, people in this world and your world are really like, mm, they, they, you know, they sit and watch the show. You know, they're like looking like that. Right. And some of them are like relaxing and enjoying it. But a lot of them are trying to do that. But in, in their hearts, people want to dream. We, people need to dream. They, people need to be amazed. They really do. It's a human thing that we have. We did a Broadway show, and Francis Ford Coppola, you know, Apocalypse Now and Godfather, he was my collaborator on the show. He is really an amazing, smart guy, technically smart guy. He knows about lighting and all that because of all the movies. He's the first person to show me text messaging. <laughs> Backstage at Caesar's Palace, he says, David, look at this. This is called text messaging. And he hands me this phone, and, I, and he goes, I says, watch, hello, David, like this. And he had another phone, he's showing like this. I said, 
that took so much time. That's never, nobody's going to like this. It's never going to work. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Watch this. I said, hello, how you doing? That took one second. This is ridiculous. I was wrong. <laughs> but he's, he, was, he was ahead of the, the curve because he showed me this thing for the first time as an example. He would sit in, my, in the audience while we were doing rehearsals, six months of rehearsals, and he'd watch the show, and all his technical crew would go backstage, because they had to, watching how we did the, the magic. And they'd go, he'd go in the, they'd go into the audience to see Francis, and the audience would go, Francis, you gotta go backstage. This is, technically, this is cooler than the show. <laughs> What's going on backstage is really great. You gotta see this. And he said, no, I don't wanna go. I don't wanna see it. Hmm. And this is for months. They said, no, he, he flies and the thing, it's, uh, we get the thing. No. It was necessary for him to keep the illusion, to keep the fantasy of it. Like Einstein said, you have to hold on to your illusions. You know, if you lose them, you're, you're dead. I said that very badly. But that, there's a quote of his like that. You know, we need the dream. So I think there's something that in, our, in us, no matter how technically savvy you are and how much technology and, 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 and smart stuff is going on to decipher things, there's a part of us that needs to be transported and needs to believe there's more to uh, you know, more to life than what we know about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the reason that, you know, uh, the, the Elon Musks and so forth, if you go, if you, when you're interviewed with him, he talked about, you know, his inspiration was comic books as a mm -hmm. kid. Not other scientists, but comic books. We need to think about the possibilities of that. And that's part of my job. My part, part of my job is to make people dream, you know, because, you know, when, when Da Vinci's, um, you know, uh, helicopter didn't work. It was kind of a dream, and then finally it worked, you know? Or Jules Verne's submarine, 20,000 leagues you know, down there, didn't work, but eventually it worked. Yeah. So I think, you know, they are all magicians, and Da Vinci actually yeah. was a magician, in fact. I was gonna say, you must be a big fan of Da Vinci's, right? I mean, I, who, who is not a do big you, fan? Do you collect some of his stuff? Like, because I know you have a lot of Houdini stuff, and... The... I don't know if it's available, you know? I mean, there's the, obviously there's the, the, the codex, all that stuff right. that exists, but no, I don't, you know, uh, but um, you? No. <laughs> yeah. you want to sell something? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, you know, his uh, contributions obviously throughout all, you know, the, the real Renaissance man of all time is obviously Da Vinci, but, you know, he, Da Vinci wrote a magic book. I found out last year, Da Vinci wrote a magic book. Mm -hmm. That made me feel really, really good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He was interested in, in what, what, I, what I love, and it's because, you know, creating wonder you know, he did it for real in many cases. He did it in dreams. He did it also in creating puzzles and, so, and, and things that, that could make people dream. And I think that's just great. Now, he was, um, you know, a very secretive man, like wrote his notes backwards and things like that. Isn't that great? That's amazing. But I, I'd like to talk to you about that as well, because I know that magic obviously is a, a very kind of secretive art. How do you develop something new? Who do you figure out who to trust? Like. Well, you know, eventually now we're in a new world, of course, you know, uh, throughout history, magic invention has become commonplace. Um, the cinema as we know it was a magic effect in a show. You know, at the Theater Robert Houdin, you know, if you saw the Coppola Dracula movie, there's a scene where Dracula walks into a, a magic theater and a train in the movie comes at, comes at you. And, you know, the movies was a trick. And then eventually storytellers took that and said, no, you know, I'm going to make that into, a, I'm going to tell stories with that, you know, use that. And, and George Melies, who was a magician, if you saw the movie Hugo, uh, was a performing magician who saw the value of a, of a, of a, a film, you know, the, the camera stopped for a second when it was shooting and the guy disappeared. He said, wow, that, that, that's a pretty good trick, you know, the camera stops and, and, and as it jumps in the thing. So that was the first special effects. And so uh, the magician who was George Méliès eventually ended up being one of the great film founders of fantasy films and dreaming. And, you know, he, he um, uh, you know, did the trip to the moon, which we can talk about, uh, you know, a little bit later. But I think, you know, uh, those, that piece of technology, which is the cinema, was a secret effect, was a secret. And then finally, was not a secret. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a, a mind reader named Alexander, the man who knows. You've seen his posters, the guy with the turban reading minds like this, that classic thing. Well, there's a reason he had a turban on, because he had all this electronics in his thing. And, and nobody knew about electronics, you know? Nobody knew about, like, 
people listening, hearing, you know, hearing devices in the bathroom, listening listen to the ladies go, my husband, you know, uh, wants to buy that Model T thing, thing you know, and, and he, on stage, my husband wants a Model T, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knew that uh, a radio was a radio. It wasn't so common. Right. So that technology could be used. There's a thing I have in my little museum, a, a Buddha, and the Buddha has his lips open. And you, the spectator will come from the audience and put your ear up to the lips, and it will go, hello. Well, that was a big deal. You know, it was like amazing. It was talking Buddha. It's just a speaker and a thing. Right. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, who knows what I have now that I'm doing that's going to be, oh, you can be used. Yeah. Somebody that's a lot smarter than me is going to use that and go, you know, make it a, a thing. You know? when, I was a, when I was a kid, Dick Tracy, there was a cartoon on TV, Side of Minecraft, for Dick, Dick Tracy. And, and Dick Tracy had a wrist radio. And there was a TV, and you could talk to the, you know, the commander in the wrist radio. I think Apple will have that out in about a year from now. <laughs> what... But they do. I mean, FaceTime is what it is. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I bought, as a, you know, 50, you know, 40 years ago, I wanted a wrist radio, and they, they had a little walkie-talkie, and the big, it wasn't, it was, on the TV thing, it was like a little w wrist thing, but the Swinney Soul for Kids was a big ra thing on your back, a big walkie-talkie on your back with cords down your thing, and you thought, you're really cool. Well, now we're talking to my daughter on the phone with FaceTime. It's like, my God, I mean, you know, what's going to happen in our, in our lifetimes? It's amazing. How do you start off, um, if, if you want to come up with a new illusion, say you're in, a, you're in your inventing mode. Yeah, is it, I am now. I am now. Are you now? So yeah, absolutely. Is it, is it, do you start with, okay, let's take for example, like say no one has ever flown before, and you say, I want to fly for the first time. Do you yeah. start with that seed of the idea, or how do you, or is it the technology first, where you're like, I know we can do this with the tech? That's a great question. I think, you know, it's like if, you, if I was a songwriter and you were to ask me, which comes first, right. the words or the music? Exactly. They would say it depends, unless it's Elton John, who only does it one, one. You know, the, uh, the the music comes first, and then he writes the, the song afterwards. Um, but it all depends. Uh, sometimes there'll be a great piece of technology. I've always wanted to fly. I've always wanted to do a flying something. And then I was working on an illusion with a uh, to escape from a a volcano. An escape from a volcano. I was going to fly out of this volcano. And we were working with lava, all kinds of different things that we could fake lava with and make real lava, you know, studying all that stuff. But then, as I was doing this, working on how I would you know, get out of this volcano, and a piece of technology came into play. And I said, screw the, the, the volcano. This is flying. This is going to be flying. Is that you researching that and yeah. figuring it out? Or yes. do you have a team that works Bo with you? Both. Both. Okay. Both, yeah. I've got great, really talented people. That's like asking a film director who's in charge. I mean, of course, I'm in charge of it, but I've got mm -hmm. people who are very, very smart in their own fields. You know, there's a, uh, Chris Kenner, Homer Leewag, people on my team uh, that are, 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 have worked with me for 20 years that, are, you know, we f research, see what the new technologies are, you know. Uh, you know, at the back of the house, a gentleman came up to us and told us about about a new thing that's halfway done uh, that we won't talk about now because I'm gonna right now because of that conversation we had in the back I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out to see right. at least I'll have maybe a five year span where I can use it before before you guys take right. it and you know make, <laughs> make phones out of it you know so uh, just try to get a shot at, at, at you know the microwave oven you know how does a micro you know uh, it's finding a, a window of time where right. I, I can I can use it and amaze people before 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 you know you folks amaze people. With it. <laughs> you have a large collection of Houdini's objects. Um, is there anything that you have that you've collected that you're still amazed by that you just haven't explained? Like, no one knows about yet? Like, you're, it's still a secret? We have just about all of Houdini's stuff. I mean, all of his water torture cell and his notebooks and his handcuffs. And, is that know, all, all public or no? Like, as far as I, the notebooks? I, 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 take exhibition, I, I take exhibitions out of there. I mean, you were there, so you saw it's all kind of very secret stuff, so you can't really do that. But I take exhibitions out from that museum. But, um, you know, uh, before Houdini, the, I mean, the real guy, even though Houdini's the big famous guy and had, did an amazing job, he got his name from Robert Houdin. And Robert Houdin was the real inventor. He invented the mystery clock, which is an amazing piece of technology. He was an automaton inventor, because uh, the internet back then was automatons, and he used the technology of that time to amaze people. Um, 
cell phones and internet back then was ether. You know, did you have have ether? Put somebody out with ether. That was the cool thing. Or these. Uh, they or, would do that. They would just knock someone out with. Well, ether. In, ho in hospital terms, but but uh, <laughs> uh, but they would. They, and he would. Have do you that. done that? Have you knocked all the time? All the time. <laughs> to myself. No. <laughs> but what he would do is he would levitate his son. And because the, the craze was this fat newfound ether thing, he would waft ether through the audience. Not enough to put them out. But they would smell the smell, and they would think that was the method of, of, the, the, of the boy floating. So he used what was prevalent at the time. I mean, he used automatons. And he'd make a fake automaton that could do more things than could be done. In my show, uh, I do an internet, a piece of internet uh, magic, because that's currently what people are doing. You know, I'm doing stuff with, uh, where magic happens on people in the middle of the audience, trying to push magic forward. I'm, I'm in that inventing mode right now. Um, but um, you know, the, uh, uh, the thing you asked, to answer your question about you know, what amazes me, I just literally got a collection of this guy Robert Houdin's work. And he's the guy that inspired Méliès, who created cinema, one of the founding forefathers of cinema. But at the theater, Robert Houdin, after he died, a lot, lot of confusing information. But anyway, uh, Houdin floated his son on, this, on the stick, using ether, supposedly. And it's a very famous picture of, of the boy floating on this stick. And 20 years ago, um, I was in France, and a friend of mine who collected all this Houdin stuff, this big film producer named Christian Feschner, took me to his house and he reached behind a thing and he pulled out the gimmick of the, the technology that was built for the sun, to, to fit the sun. And he put it in my hands and I had it in my hands and I began to cry holding this thing. And it's because for 30 years of doing this, I'd watched this, this picture, this drawing, this, this thing, and I'm holding the real object in my hand. So I was like, oh my god. And uh, I, I wanted this for my museum so bad. And, and, uh, and of course, it belongs in France as part of French culture and you know, all this kind of stuff. And last year, I smuggled it out of France. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, sorry. Sorry, French. <laughs> I'm taking good care of it, though. <laughs> I Cry no more. <laughs> Tell me if this is a true story. I heard one time someone tried to mug you, yeah. and they were unsuccessful. Well, no, they were successful. They were successful. <laughs> they took your wallet. No, they took everyone else's uh, money. But uh, I, in an act of amazing stupidity, I, I used magic to not give him my wallet uh, and, uh, and my passport and so forth. You know, there's a, there's a way, there's a technique. And I did it, which is really ridiculous with a gun in your face. So there was a, That's a true story. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was like an no. internet thing. No, no, no. So no. Uh, there was a gun pointed at you. They said, no. pull out many your wallet, guns, and guns. you made it vanish. And didn't no, 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 no. So that, I wasn't that stupid. Okay. That went really, no, 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 no. It was, it was a, you know. A, some of my associates with me, and you know, a car, pull, a car pulls up, and a bunch of kids come out of the car, and I get my pen out to sign autographs. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know who the hell I was at all. <laughs> the guns come out like that, you know, in my, in my face, and you know, the, the, he was like, no problem, no problem. The girls gave the, gave the money to, to him. I showed my pockets empty. They weren't empty. <laughs> But luckily, they, they, you know, they, they, they left at that point. But it's really, really stupid. You know, guns in your face, just give them the money. That's amazing. <laughs> really stupid. What's in your pocket? Bam! No, 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 no. That didn't happen. Um, so I want to talk briefly about uh, what you're doing today yeah. and where you see yourself in five years. I know that you are on a crazy schedule. You have two shows tonight. Yeah. And how many shows have you been doing? Like, I've heard it's uninterrupted for how long now? We're doing an 11-week run, 11 week run. I never take a day off during when we're doing runs. So I, I do uh, 15 shows a week uh, for 11 weeks straight uh, with no days off. But I get to do this and hang out with you guys, right? Which is, which is awesome. Um, and um, so my days are free, you know. But that, you know, that's a different thing. I don't know, in, in the world of uh, technology and business, what is an example of me doing a show? What would you say? 
for, when I go, I, I get to walk out and people are smiling at me and they're like happy and they're applauding and they, they like look at me like they really, there's a couple people that don't really love me, but, <laughs> but, but you know, mostly they're there. They paid, you know, the hundred bucks or whatever. They, they said they're kind of happy, you know, so yeah. it's, it's kind of a good thing. The, mm -hmm. the, you know, the day before of, of doing the business or the lawyers or the contracts, that's no good. But the show itself, is it, what's that in your world? I think it, it has to be when you're doing a startup and you get so much excitement that it doesn't feel like you're working. You just you're doing what you love, and so you lose track of time. It's two in the morning. It's kind of the same, same idea. Thing. Yeah. And then the and when it works, that's probably yeah. the thing. You, the, you, you get the curse. Yeah. That, that the adrenaline thing. you get in the rush. Yeah. yeah. So, so the shows don't. You know, you shouldn't. You know, pat me on the back for doing that many shows. And oh, that's good. That's yeah. But we take like sick days. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I take ten weeks off a year. Ten or twelve, 12 weeks off a year. Yeah. And I, I go. You know, I've got a, um, a nice place to go. So, it's um. You know, it's, it's, it's good. But right now, you know, I'm inventing new stuff all the time, and that's good. That's like the startup. That's the mm -hmm. example of startup. Sure. Tons of problems and struggles, puzzles have to be solved, but when you make that turn and finally something that doesn't work for a while finally works, it's really rewarding, yeah. you know? And you, you know, I'm doing a thing in my show now where I'm levitating a guy in the audience, surrounded by them, like right in the middle of the audience, you know, not in the aisle, just right in the middle of the audience. And for two years, you know, the levitation part of it was an invention of a friend of mine, the levitation part. But another thing happens in the middle of the audience where you couldn't do it in the middle of the audience. So we took two years with this one guy's invention and added our invention to it, the fact of doing it in the audience and that kind of condition, and it didn't work for two years. It just, it wouldn't be right. And after every show, I would keep the audience, I'd keep 100 people from the audience. And they'd stay there, and I'd try this out, and I'd interview them. And they'd say, oh, that sucked, and then we saw that, and you know. And then we'd do it again and again and again, just try to kind of carve off all the problem areas. And these are real audience members that oh, you had? Yeah, that's real amazing. And you sw swear them to secrecy, please don't Google, the, don't, don't, don't <laughs> you know, put this on your Facebook, or, right. and they go, oh, please don't talk about that. And they kind of did it. They kind of. I had no haters, you know, luckily in those groups. So. Uh, <laughs> that is the PC term, haters, haters yeah, I yeah. think that's right. Um, and um, I, didn't have, I didn't have assholes either, no assholes either. So. <laughs> uh, they actually were, pre were pretty good. And, um, but for two years, and finally it worked. And it's amazing. Now I get up there and I'm just, I can't wait to do it. You know, I do it and I watch, and my staff who works as hard, if not harder than me, sits there around me in the thing, and they see the audience go, whoa, like erupt in like amazement. And they sit there and they go, <laughs> they, they were part of something that they were trying, they see it finally happen. So that's very rewarding just to watch my own people's faces be rewarded by failure, 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 success, and it finally works. And um, it's good, you know, and so that process is very good. We're creating a new show now that's really based on inspiring people, trying to take people, using magic as a metaphor, uh, to live the impossible, to find whatever your own impossible is in your own life, especially if you're not a magician. Find that thing you were told no about, that you couldn't do, you know, the fact that, you know, Everest was an impossible thing until 60 years ago today, that, you know, and then if one guy does it, and then, okay. People are doing it's not, not yeah. in the news. It's, it's, it's a common thing, you know. Uh, running the you know the Roger Bannister mile, the four minute mile, it was impossible. So my magic is really a kind of a, a metaphor of that, you know. I'm not. I'm trying not to do tricks because there are really hard work behind it. I'm trying to do things that will inspire people, hopefully to to take their own lives and, and find possibilities and uh, get a little bit of strength that uh, you know they can do it too, whatever their endeavor is. And this isn't something where you invent something and you roll it to, into your existing show, or is it you're going to unveil a whole new show in a few years? No, I, I, my technique, I don't have, I'm not that uh, ballsy. <laughs> no, I, I, I slowly put things uh, into the show. And I, I do the Beatles, you know, I used to love how the Beatles would have an album and there was, you know, things that they knew people would love and then they'd stick in the album something that would be a test. And that would, if that had legs, they would expand it out. Mm -hmm. So I, can't, I kind of try to, to, to uh, I know where I'm going with the stuff, and the stuff that's risky or new, technologically new or interesting or, or story interesting uh, uh, or revolutionary in my own way, I'll sneak that in the show. And there's a piece I'm doing in the show, and people are liking it right now, with a little alien. And I have a, literally, I have a stuffed animal on stage to represent the alien. 
people don't mind. It's my, my, my family goes, why? You, how can you have this stupid stuffed animal as part of this trick? It's not, do wait for the real thing. But no, I'm, I'm trying it out slowly to kind of see, uh, I guess in technological terms, it would be kind of market testing. What would you call when you? Like a beta test. Like a beta test. Yeah. But my, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I charge money for my beta test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be good enough, you know. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Can I get a thanks. round of applause for David? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.